I'm not very good with microphones. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I say that, if I talk like this, can you hear me okay? Better. You better? Yeah. Can I do that? Uh, yeah. Uh, is, good? is that cool? Yeah, cool. Oh, awesome. Excellent. All right. Okay, so yeah, I, uh, I've got an hour, I've got 20 minutes to squeeze in an hour's talk, uh, so I'm going to talk quickly and in parallel. Uh, so uh, I do three things. One is I uh, run a master's program in UCL. Uh, it's called business analytics, but it's essentially called apply, applied AI. So I have 50 students every year going out there, working with companies like you, uh, applying these emerging technologies. And my entire academic background is in AI. I've been studying AI for the past 18 years. Uh, and uh, the second thing I do is I run a company called Satalia, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and the third thing I do is I travel the world educating industry and academia and politicians about the impact of uh, technology on society. I'm deeply concerned about the future and hopefully at the end of this talk you will be concerned too. Uh, this is, uh, is going to be quite controversial. It's going to be also very interactive, so hopefully you're nice and warm, which of course you are. All right, so the, we're going to talk about three things, AI, innovation and the end of the world, if we've got some time. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to get us all on the same page of what AI is and what AI isn't. Uh, I'm sure that you all uh, have a definition in your mind, but I want us to go away today with, a, with an understanding, well, my understanding of what AI is. Before I do, I'm going to take you along this, uh, this technology stack. And uh, the first thing I want to ask you, I'm sure many of you have heard the word data and use data. Uh, what is data? Oh, good. Huh? No, no information's here? Huh? Numbers. Numbers, yeah, symbols. It comes from the Latin word datum, which means stuff or given things. It's symbols. It's the fabric of our universe. It's this light. It's this sound um, that, that we have to make sense of. In fact, I would argue that information is uh, putting data into context. So uh, if I say to you 210280, what's that? Yeah, it's data. If I say that it's a date of birth, then it becomes information. All right, next easy question. What does this probably say? Maybe two. Yeah, good. <laughs> and what does this probably say? Okay, good. But we can see that the light that's entering your eyes, the stuff that's going into the eyes, is the same light, but you're giving it a different meaning based on its context. Um, if I say to you, uh, if I tweet right now, my laptop is sick, what does that mean? Awesome. Oh, good. Your kids? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sick is a piece of data, and we can interpret that in two different ways. One is good, one is bad. Uh, what does this say? John read the letter to Mary. Anybody else? John read the letter to Mary? Yep. OK, well, picture in your head, John read the letter to Mary. Picture that scene in your mind. John read the letter to Mary. What picture do you have in your head? John read the letter to Mary. John holding the letter. Holding the letter, yeah. and then what is he doing? Out loud to Mary. Anybody else have a different picture? He's reading it before he sends it to Mary. John is reading a letter that is going to be sent to Mary. Anybody else? What if they're learning the alphabet and I said John read the letter to Mary? Or if the letter is the name of a book and I said John read the letter to Mary? Or if the name of a book is called the letter to Mary and I say John read the letter to Mary? Or John, then we could be doing, John read the letter of the law to Mary. In fact, this piece of data here can be interpreted in over 13 different ways. And you all go away with a picture in your head of what you think is correct, but you're probably wrong. And uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in computer science is taking this messy world of stuff and figuring out what does it actually mean. OK, let's, assuming that, let's assume that I've done my job and I've taken this messy stuff and I've contextualized it. And I give you a spreadsheet. And in the spreadsheet, it has three columns. It has a column, which is the date. date a column which is the temperature on that date, and a column which is the number of ice creams that I sold on that date. Date, temperature, ice cream sales. What do you do with that information? Correlate. Correlate it. OK, and how would you do that? What would you do? Chart it. Chart it. OK, so uh, let's draw a graph. So along the x-axis, we have the increase in temperature, and along the y-axis, we have the uh, number of ice cream sales. What would our graph look like? Not a trick question. Good, yes, so uh, we'll see some sort of trend going upwards. This is called descriptive analytics. Um, we can do something really cool now. We can do a thing called predictive analytics. We can put a line through it. Uh, and now what we have is predictive power. So I've, got, I've now got predictive power because I can look at my graphic and I can see a given temperature, how many ice creams I need to manufacture, even if I've never seen that temperature before. And what machine learning does is it allows us to find these, uh, to organize information in a way to help us find patterns, patterns to know things about the world. So from my graph, I know that when it's hotter, I sell more ice creams. Great. And I would argue that knowledge is organizing information in a way to help us find patterns. Um, but knowing something doesn't mean that you understand it. So according to my model of the world, according to my graph, 
Uh, what's going to happen if it's really, really hot? Huh? I'm going to sell a shitload of ice creams, right? That's what's going to happen. And I could take this model, I can put it into a factory, and I can let the factory manufacture ice creams based on this model. But what will really happen if tomorrow is the hottest day ever? Ever, ever, ever. What will really happen? OK, people will stay home. So my graph is wrong. It's more like this. And uh, eh? people are just sleep, maybe. maybe. Uh, if, OK, so let's take a step back. Why do we sell ice creams when it's hot outside? Huh? It's, okay, it's, a hot out, it's a hot outside, I'm inside, what's the first thing that happens? I go outside, good, excellent, so I go outside, and why do I go outside? FOMO. Huh? FOMO. FOMO? Fear of missing. Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. I'm not down with the kids. Uh, uh, we don't have acronyms in my company for this very reason. Uh, uh, so I go outside because humans like to be warm, and then what happens? I get too warm, and then what happens? Huh? I go in. I look for ice cream, or what do I do with ice cream? Put it down my pants. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Eat it, and why do, then what happens? Cool down. Okay, and why do I cool down? Yeah, Thermodynamics. <laughs> okay, to expect a, a, a computer to understand that narrative from the, the data that I've given it is a big ask. Okay, so understanding something is very, very different to knowing something. And if I had a domain expert look at my model of the world, I'd say, that's silly, Daniel. Uh, it looks more like this, because I understand what's actually going on in the world. Uh, because ultimately we want to create the correct narrative, narrative of the world so that we can ultimately make good decisions. And I would argue that uh, wisdom is using our understanding to drive some sort of uh, um, uh, goal. It seems like every company at the moment that touches this stack is calling themselves an AI company. This is not AI. Uh, uh, so th this top part of the stack is actually around decision making. And I would argue that humans are terrible at decision making. Um, I'm going to give you some examples. Um, has anybody read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? Good. Uh, uh, so it, I'd highly recommend that you read this book. It will help you understand that humans are pretty rubbish at making decisions. Uh, and it, uh, Daniel Kahneman argues that we have two brains. We have a fast brain and a slow brain. So if I say to you, what's two times two? That's your fast brain, some of, you, some of your fast brains. Uh, what's uh, 17 times 463? <laughs> that's, that's, that's your slow brain. And I can give you uh, some examples of where your fast brain operates. So what color is this? Brown, what color is this? Yellow. Actually, it's exactly the same color. So I promise you that the light that's going into your eyes right now is exactly the same color. Your brain is manipulating it and changing it based on millions of years of evolution. So if I put a piece of paper in front of this, um, it will show you that both of, the, that both of those are brown. Um, I can, uh, maybe here's another one. I always get this wrong, but what color is this? I think it's this. What color is this? Blue. Okay, what color is this? Blue. No, this one. Uh, yellow? yellow? Yeah, okay, and actually they're all gray. So the, the gray, gray light is going into your eyes and your brain is giving it a different meaning based on the context and based on your evolutionary and biological history. I can give you thousands of these examples. You won't be able to see those as gray. You can't easily rewire your brain and see those exactly how they actually they are. Uh, Okay, so if you've, if you've read Thinking Fast and Slow, don't answer this question. Imagine, um, uh, you, I give you, I'm going to give you some maths questions now, and your job is to answer these maths questions as fast as possible, because if you don't, then your competitors are going to answer them faster than you. They're going to grab your market. All right, so you've got to answer them really, really quickly. They're going to start out really easily, uh, easy, and then they get more and more complicated. So the first one is easy. Uh, the combined price of a bat and a ball is one pound and ten pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? 10 pence? 10 pence? <laughs> it's not 10 pence. You're not broken. It's 5 pence. The bat is 1 pound and 5 pence. The ball is 5 pence. The combined price is 1 pound and 10 pence. If you've seen this example before, I can send you loads and loads of examples and you will get them wrong. Humans are rubbish at this kind of stuff. We're really good at pattern matching, like machine learning. So we're really good at hearing 1 pound and 10 and, and then 1 pound and, and then guessing 10. That's not the, the right answer. Uh, so let me give you another question. So, Imagine these, I don't know, our, our staff members or these are, I don't know, ch channels to spend marketing money or whatever. We, we, and we know everything about these staff members. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but my, your job is to orientate these staff members in a way that satisfy these rules. So flying staff members have got to be the right of walking staff members and no same colors are allowed to be next to each other and males like to be near females. Can anybody tell me how many possible orientations of these staff members are there? So here's one orientation. I can swap two around. I get another orientation. How many possible orientations do I have? Huh? Nope, nearly. 
five factorial, five times four times three times three. So there's 120 possible orientations of those five staff members, of which many of them won't satisfy those rules. Some will, but one will be the optimal. One will be the best one that satisfies all of those rules. Let's make the problem more complicated. 15 staff members. Can anybody tell me how many possible combinations, guess, there are? Guess? That's, that's a, yeah? 100,000? OK, so over a trillion possible combinations. So 15 times 14 times 13, blah, 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 into your calculator. That's how many, problem, that's how many possible uh, uh, orientations there are, of which only one will be the best one. We've got humans solving these problems. Anything, my rule of thumb is anything more than seven, don't use a human for. <laughs> anything more than, we, we're rubbish at this. OK, and actually industry have these problems, right? Not just 15. Uh, 500 Pokemon, can anybody tell me how many possible orientations there are? Many. Huh? Many? OK, so it's a number that's over 1,000 digits. That's the number. And to put that into context, that's how many atoms there are in the universe. And maybe to put this into context, uh, one of our clients is a large consultancy company. They have 200,000 Pokemon, 200,000 staff members that they need to allocate to projects a year. 200,000 is a number that is over 9 mil million digits. And they have 400 people sitting in a room trying to figure out how to solve this problem. They are wasting their time. Wasting Let me just labor the point a little bit. Uh, imagine I've got my ice cream factory and I've got my artificial intelligent ice cream van and I've got to deliver packages to these 24 points across London. So I've got to figure out what's the shortest path around these points. So if we were, humans are quite good at solving these problems actually. If we were here and we wanted to draw a nice route around these points, where would you go first? Closest point, this is a greedy algorithm, so closest point, closest point, closest point. This is, we'd probably get quite a nice route around those points. It won't be the optimal solution. Okay, how, how long will it take a computer to get the best solution, the shortest path? Seconds? Yeah? So we'll play this game already. It's 20 billion years. So if you put 24 times 23 times 22, blah, 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 into your calculator, this is how many possible routes there are around those 24 points. And if you had a computer that could look at a million routes a second, it would take longer than the age of our universe, 20 billion years to go through all possible combinations to say this one here that I looked at 10 billion years ago, this one's the shortest one. <laughs> if I put in another point, I've got now 25 points. How long will it take? 25 times 20 billion years, so what's that, 4,000 billion years? If I add another point to the map, 27 times, 26 times 4,000 billion years. These problems are exponential. Uh, they exist throughout our lives. We don't realize how complicated they are. Um, and again, just to put this into context, one of our clients is Tesco. They're delivering to 100,000 points on a map a day. 100,000 points, not 24. And we have milliseconds be between each customer coming in to show as many slots as possible to those customers and to optimize their uh, fleet of uh, 5,000 vehicles. And the reason why I talk about this is because there's lots and lots of excitement around machine learning at the moment. Uh, when we build AI solutions for companies, they have at least these three, three technologies. The first part is data. And maybe you should ask me questions later about data. I don't have enough time to answer them now. Data, obviously, is important, making sure you've got the right data. Uh, data science, machine learning is really good at finding patterns in data. It's really good at identifying who are males and females in this room, whether you're happy or sad, predicting if somebody's going to churn. It is not good at making optimization uh, problems, solving optimization problems. You, you're not going to be able to build a, a statistical algorithm that solves the traveling salesman problem, that solves these types of problems. And so I expect over the coming decade, five years, organizations are going to realize that data science is great at finding patterns, but they're going to have to hire a whole new set of skills People that have um, expertise in discrete mathematics, they used to be called operations researchers, uh, but these are people that have expertise in optimization and decision making. Uh, and what my company does is that we bring these technologies together, and I think there are very, very few companies that do that. I still don't think this is AI. Okay, so I think that uh, this is automation. You give it data, it goes through some sort of model, and I, whether I've used machine learning to create that model or where, whether I've used linear, re linear regression, it doesn't matter. It goes through some sort of model, it makes a decision. I give it the same data, it makes the same decision. What's the definition of stupidity or insanity? Doing the same thing. Good, uh, excellent. It's doing the same thing over again and expecting a different answer. Uh, most systems, in fact, every system that I have seen in production is this. Uh, and I would, uh, so there's two definitions of AI. One I think is a weak definition and one is a strong definition. The weak definition is getting computers to do things as good or better than humans. 
And the reason why we're, we're talking about AI now is because we're now building machine learning models that can recognize whether uh, somebody's male or female, that can understand language as good or better than humans. But I would argue that humans are not intelligent. Benchmarking uh, machine intelligence against humans is not a sensible thing to do. Uh, the strong definition of AI that I've, uh, I did my master's on intelligence uh, is this. The, the, it, it comes from the definition of intelligence itself. The definition of intelligence is goal-directed adaptive behavior. Goal-directed in the sense we're trying to achieve an objective. We're trying to sell as many ice creams as possible. We're trying to route our vehicles as optimally as possible, whatever. Behavior is how quickly or frictionlessly can we move to, towards that goal. But if you don't have adaptivity, you only have automation. So for, for me, a system is only AI if it makes a decision and then learns whether that decision is good or bad, bad and then changes its own internal model of the world without the aid of a human. What currently happens in production is you, you run your systems, you give that data to a data scientist, they improve the models, six months later you improve your systems. This is currently how systems are adapting in production and, uh, and, I, and I think the real true paradigm of AI are systems that can adapt in milliseconds as opposed to months. Would anybody agree or disagree with that? You can push back any time. Anyway, uh, and building adaptive systems in production is hard. It's 10 times harder than building autonomous systems. If you, go, if you approach your head of IT and say, we're going to put a system in place, and tomorrow we're going to give it data and make a decision, and the next day it might make a different decision. They're going to say, you're not putting that in production. We need to really understand how those systems are going to behave uh, because you might have other, other dependencies. And you remember the Microsoft Twitter bot that became racist and sexist very quickly? That's what happens when you put adaptive systems in production. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Two types of AI, I don't know whether I should bore you with this, symbolic AI, this is Socrates, Socrates is famous for the Socratic method, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, from, from that I can infer what? That so Socrates is mortal, this is uh, 70s and 80s AI, we used to build rules and then we used to uh, uh, infer new knowledge from those rules, this didn't really scale, I actually think this is going to have a renaissance over the next decade, uh, and then in the 80s and 90s, new type, type of AI came along, Subsymbolic AI, neural networks. This is the brain of a bumblebee. My PhD was to model the brain of a bumblebee. M bumblebees have a million neurons, smaller than the end of a needle. You have 80 billion neurons, but bumblebees can do amazing things. They can navigate 3D worlds. They communicate with each other. They solve problems. They don't deal with windows very well, but ultimately <laughs> they are they're very, very smart little creatures. And uh, the idea was that we would take this power of a, of a bumblebee brain, we put in a helicopter and have helicopters navigating 3D worlds, solving problems, not dealing with windows very well, but they'd be the smartest helicopters we would ever build. Uh, this was my PhD in the uh, early 2000. No, it wasn't. I don't know when it was. It was a while ago. And, uh, and this didn't really scale. We could build neural networks that could recognize whether a biscuit was broken or not, but we couldn't build ne uh, neural networks that could do anything interesting. Now, over the past decade, we've got now deep learning. Deep learning is neural networks on steroids, and now we can build brains that can do things that humans can do. And this is exciting. But again, these brains are good at finding patterns. They're not good at solving optimization problems. Now, you need to be able to combine this type of AI to, with this type of AI to really drive value in your organizations. Okay, so um, I would argue that if we put our minds to it, we could probably build an AI solution that can solve a problem better than any, that can perform better than any human. If we really put our minds to it, if this semicircle was the bounds of human ability, we can build individual systems now that can outperform us at probably almost anything apart from creativity, but that will soon be replaced. Uh, but this is inefficient. It's inefficient building individual systems. So there's going to be this interesting drive over the coming decade about building AGI, artificial general, general intelligence systems that can do a range of things better than humans. So can, can you get build a system that can do 40 things instead of building 40 systems? And if you take this to its extreme over the coming several decades, uh, it's predicted in the next, within the next 50 years, we're going to build a brain smarter than us in every single possible way. This will be the last invention that we ever create. It's often referred to as superintelligence or the technological singularity, and nobody knows what's going to happen when this happens. It's probably our biggest existential threat to humanity, and most scholars believe it's going to happen in the next 50 years. It keeps me awake at night. Uh, <laughs> I can talk a lot about this. In fact, some people believe it's already happened. If you, uh, have you heard of the Fermi paradox? If you look at the size of the universe and the age of the universe, the, it's very big and it's very old. The likelihood of there being intelligent life in our universe is very high. The likelihood of that intelligent life building a superintelligence like we will soon is also very high. So imagine you build something godlike in its ability to understand the universe, navigate space and time. The paradox is this. Why is it when we look into the night sky do we not see any evidence of life. Our universe should be teeming with life. 
mathematically. And the hypothesis is that we're living in a simulation created by a superintelligence in a different universe. <laughs> oh, yes. Huh? And that's a spoticum. Yes, well, who, who knows? Uh, and actually, um, um, a lot of people, Elon Musk, people like that, they believe this is true. I actually probably believe this is true, although, again, that keeps me awake at night. I haven't even started yet, by the way. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, uh, before we build a superintelligence, we're having to build systems that are having to make ethical decisions. You've all seen this problem before. Trolley problem. In I've got me in my driverless car. In front, I've got a kid. To the right, I've got two adults. And to the left, I've got a cliff. The car can't stop. Who does the car kill? Itself? What if you've got your kid in the, you, your kid in the car? Huh? You totally can't stop. It's the kids run out. The car can't stop. Can't, it's, you've got a cliff, people, or kid. Who decides? The car. You, the car decides. <laughs> we're, we're having to build these solutions into these systems. And in fact, I heard that maybe we'll have an ethical setting in our car that where we'll say we like to kill cats over dogs or anything like that. I also heard that maybe one day we'll have a brain scan and our personality will be put in that car and it will behave how we would behave in that particular situation, uh, which I don't think is a good idea. Okay, let me ask you another question. Imagine there's a burning, burning building and in the burning building there's a crying baby and a suitcase with a billion dollars. What do you save if you can only save one? Crying baby? Huh? Oh, somebody watching. It's good insight into your brain. How many babies can you save with a billion dollars? Oh, it's a horrible question, that one, isn't it? Uh, so uh, so um, I'm really interested in the concept called explainable AI. Uh, once we build these algorithms, we're going to have to be able to explain how they're making their decisions. It's extremely hard. GDPR is going to force us to do this. Nobody's really thinking about this. It's very, very difficult. OK, innovation. Right, so uh, just take a moment just to look at this and uh, just read this slide. This is a hierarchy. I think this is broken. This is how currently um, uh, uh, companies operate. They breed these types of relationships. This is not a snap snapshot of Satalia, uh, uh, but um, this is how um, uh, relationships look like within organizations. And I think this model is broken. In fact, I expect that over the coming decade, um, this technology stack that I, that I described, the kind of the data, the machine learning, the AI, it will all be commoditized. We already have access to this, these three. We already have access to free data, free compute, and, and uh, a load of free tools to help us find patterns. And I'm sure that somebody somewhere will commoditize the decision-making component and have themselves learn. The next big battleground for companies to win are for talent. How can you enable your talent to use these technologies to drive new innovations in your company? The faster you can innovate, the more intelligent you are. It's all about adapting quickly to a changing world. And the best definition of in innovation that I've ever found is by Steve Jobs. He said, innovation is creativity that ships. What's the most important word in that definition? Who thinks creativity? Who thinks ships? You're all from industry. I think it's the word that. All of my questions, <laughs> all of my questions are trick questions. Um, so uh, that is the process of taking ideas and getting them to the point where somebody's willing to, to pay for them. That is an extremely painful process. And the idea is for organizations, if you can shorten that process, you'll adapt more quickly and beat your competitors. The question is, how do you motivate your employees to innovate? There's a very good introductory book by Dan Pink, who wrote a book called Drive. He said there are three things that motivate people, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is giving people freedom to do whatever they want. Mastery is giving them the ability to become really good at what they want to do. And purpose is giving them something higher to align themselves with. Dan would now argue that there's two types of purpose. There's a big P purpose and a small P purpose. The big P purpose is the higher thing, and the little P purpose is feeling like every day you're making, a, you're making an impact. Uh, so, the first challenge is how do you attract talent? And I often ask organizations who we work with, where are you on this matrix? On one dimension, how sexy is your brand or your industry? The other dimension is how interesting or challenging are your problems? If you're not sexy, you don't have interesting problems, you are not going to attract talent. You need to be honest with yourself. If you're sexy and, you're got, and you've got interesting problems, you'll attract talent and they'll most likely stick. And if you're in the other two quadrants, then you'll attract talent, but they will churn. They will go somewhere else after a few years. And that can be more dangerous to a company than not attracting talent at all. And this will dictate whether you're going to build out your own team, work with third party vendors, blah, blah, blah. Once you've attracted talent, you need to figure out how do I create the right culture to enable that talent to thrive, to enable that talent to innovate. And, uh, and so this is my rant about organizations. We've seen over the past uh, several decades a flattening of organizations, a removing of managers, because we know that this isn't very efficient, and uh, in new communication technologies, JIRA and all that kind of stuff, to help, can help us communicate better. I would still argue that a thin organization is wrong. Uh, I am interested in building completely decentralized, distributed organizations. So Satalia, 80 people. We have no KPIs. I'd be really interested to know how that would work here. N no KPIs. 
No managers, no hierarchy, no rules. You can work from whenever, wherever you want, how you want. Last year, we had everybody make public recommendations for their own salary, and then everybody voted on whether those salaries should be increased or decreased or kept the same. And we had machine learning that was determining how many votes one person had for another. So it's like a democracy, but weighted. I had interns voting on my salary. I had interns voting on other people's salary who had more higher weighting than me. And we, so we, look at, we use machine learning, we look at our digital footprint, and we say, you are a better decision maker at this than me. And I, and I believe that the future is completely decentralized organizations. And so I'm trying to build a platform inside my company to allow anybody internally to be able to work on whatever they want, however they want, and to be remunerated fairly for it. And if you take this to its extreme, then in theory, you can create a decentralized world. I want to create a world, this is going to sound crazy, I want the, my success criteria for Satalia is to remove the concept of Satalia. I, I am deeply concerned about the accumulation of and wealth of power in a handful of companies, the Apples and the Facebooks and, and those, those companies, and uh, they have won the capitalistic model. They can hoover up talent, they can innovate quickly, they can make you feel nice and safe and have bean bags and free food. They've won, they've won the game. And they can, it's going to be very, very difficult for organizations to compete with them. So I have to ask myself, how does Satalia, how does our, do our, the companies that we work with compete with companies that have access to infinite capital? Amazon has infinite capital. How do you compete with that company? And the question is, is you remove the concept of a company. So I want to, um, over the course of the next 30 years, remove the idea of companies. So I'm going to try and build a platform that allows anybody to boot up an idea, for example, Just Eat, don't want to use this as an example, I'll use it as an example. But imagine somebody said, actually, I've got this really great idea, just eat, open, just eat, and I'm going to enable anybody from anywhere in the world, whether a developer, a designer, a strategist, an accountant, whatever, to be able to contribute to that platform and to be re remunerated fairly for it, so you're in China or wherever. Uh, I don't think you have to have a centralized company to have Facebook, to have Uber, to have Google, to have Airbnb. I think many of these applications, if we are clever can be completely decentralized and they can be commoditized and free for everybody, almost free. Let me give you an example. Facebook have two billion users. Right? Let's not be under any illusion. Their job is to make a return for their shareholders. That's their job. Otherwise, Mark Zuckerberg gets fired. And, uh, and how do you make more money for your shareholders? Huh? Ads? You, yeah, you need, you need people looking at that screen. They have 10,000 PhDs whose job it is to keep you and your kids looking at that screen. Who's going to win? I think they're going to win. And, uh, and because they, ha they, they have the, this model where they have to make returns for their shareholders. And uh, if you created an open version of Facebook, a Facebook where anybody can contribute to that platform, anybody can drive it forwards and be remunerated fairly for it, uh, wh the question is, where do you get the remuneration from? Would you pay 10 pence per year to access an open version of Facebook without having anybody show you ads or trying to get you looking at the screen? Would you pay 10 pence? Okay, so 10 pence, and if you had only 10% of Facebook's users, that's 200 million pounds. That's more than enough to service a community of 500 people that could develop an open version of Facebook. What it takes is a platform that enables all of the different business functions to be able to come together and, and work together in a decentralized way. I won't bore you with the stuff that we're doing in Satalia. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the Black Mirror episode of social scoring. If you're interested in, in this topic, I've just written two articles, both set in 2048. One is a dystopian view of the world, this world, and another is a utopian view of the world where there are no countries, no uh, companies, and that we are all contributing positive, positively to society. So when it comes to purpose, the purpose of Satalia is to enable everybody to do the work they want or everybody to do what they love. In a world where you don't have to work and that world isn't far away, um, how can we enable people to have their basic needs met and to be able to, uh, to do the things that they want to do? And, and I have a 30-year roadmap to try and make that happen. And, and the people in my company also want to try and make that happen as well. We make money by helping other companies make money and save money, but really we're trying to solve these big problems that we're going to foresee over the next two decades. And that is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah.